Well, good morning, good day, good evening, everyone. We really welcome you and we're pleased you could join us for a special VIP session today with Kevin Rudd, president of the Asia Society and president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Kevin is one of the world's leading, if not the leading China expert, will offer his perspectives on Xi Jinping's pivot to the state, the impact of ideology, demography, and decoupling on Xi's new economic policy framework. Now we've all been watching in recent days and weeks, a whirlwind of activity surrounding China's treatment of the private sector. It started almost a year ago last October with the suspension of Ant Group's IPO, and it was followed by a number of other actions, including antitrust fines on Alibaba at unprecedented levels. But it's picked up enormous intensity and speed in early July with what I would call a ton of bricks falling on DD um, after it issued an IPO in the New York Stock Exchange. And this set off a series of targeted actions, new policies, new regulations and laws reigning in Chinese private sector and promoting the concepts of common prosperity and dual circulation. It's hit many sectors. It hasn't been limited to the tech sector. It's hit transportation, education, finance, and now entertainment. And the flurry of activity seems to be far from over. We looked to Kevin this morning to help us unpack these developments and help us frame them in a broader strategic context. Specifically, he will help us better understand what's driving these policy shifts. What do they mean for the Chinese economy? What are the risks? What are the challenges? Why are they priorities for Xi Jinping? And what does this mean for US-China relations going forward and for US firms doing business with China. Now, before I turn to Kevin, just a few housekeeping details. After Kevin speaks, I will join him for a short discussion. And that part, uh, the, this part will be recorded. Following that, we will have, um, I will turn to folks um, in the audience and I urge you to either use your raise hand function or let me know through the chat room that you'd like to ask a question, but that part of the program will not be recorded. So with that, over to you, Kevin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wendy, and uh, greetings to everybody. Um, Wendy's right. Most of us have been bewildered by what's been happening in terms of this series of policy statements, announcements by the Chinese authorities uh, directed in large part of the Chinese private sector over nearly 12 months now, but gathering in intensity over the summer. So what I've tried to do uh, in the last uh, period of time is make sense of this um, and to ask what actually is happening, why is it happening, and what does it mean in terms of uh, future directions for growth uh, in the Chinese economy? Um, the reason this is important is that uh, China's uh, economic performance uh, is the biggest factor affecting Chinese domestic political stability, biggest factor affecting, frankly, the future of US-China relations, and it's a huge factor affecting global economic growth, given the fact that Chinese growth has represented on average for the last decade about half the global growth factor. So what China does here really matters for all of us at multiple levels. My second point really is this. So what's the nature of the change that we're looking at? How are we best able to summarize it? What I say uh, in my prepared remarks, which I've uh, had distributed to everyone joining us, um, so that uh, if you like afterwards, uh, work your way through it or throw it in the bin, whichever is easiest for you, um, is to characterize these changes as a deliberate policy by Xi Jinping to move the economic dial the center of gravity of Chinese economic policy towards the left. Um, and what do I mean by left? I don't mean it in a pejorative sense, I just mean it in an analytical and descriptive sense. If the barometer of economic policy has state and party control at one end of the axis, 
and the market determining the allocation of resources and economy at the other end of the axis. What we've seen with this series of measures now from Xi Jinping is moving that dial more in the direction of the party and the state and further away from the market. Um, and uh, this is important for us to take stock of. Furthermore, how do we make that judgment and how is it seen in terms of concrete instruments of policy? Well, I identified four or five of them. One of them is uh, the rehabilitation of what we would call industry policy or industrial policy in the West. That is the state taking the direct lead in particular sectors of the economy where they weren't necessarily taking as strong a lead in the past. Uh, for example, we're all familiar with what they're doing in technology policy with the China 2025 strategy, but that's now been doubled down on. And there's now a new, as it were, special investment fund of some 1 trillion US uh, dedicated to China achieving enormous breakthroughs in high technology, particularly in semiconductors, in order to set China up robustly and independently for the future. Second area that we see this movement to the left on is state and enterprise um, policy more generally. Um, under previous Chinese administrations, SOEs, as we call them, were almost an endangered species. Um, that is, um, they were told to reform, to uh, downsize their staff, to do rationalisation of their assets, and to, frankly, uh, do something about their accumulated debt. And while those disciplines haven't been removed altogether, we see a whole new phase of state-owned enterprise reform, where reform actually has been redefined itself, so that the state-owned enterprise sector now is given a whole new set of state investment funds, not only just to expand their own operations, but to invest in private firms, and to some, in some cases, merge with them as well. Third area is what I describe as the selective application of Chinese monopoly law against big Chinese tech firms. Of course, we're familiar with a number of them, uh, JD, uh, Alibaba and others. Uh, but the anti-monopoly laws in China uh, don't seem to be being applied to the traditional monopolies in the state-owned sector, but to the new areas uh, where we see large Chinese firms emerging in the tech sector and tech platforms. Which brings us to the fourth area of change, and I would say movement to the left, which is uh, the new set of Chinese data security laws and new compliance regimes brought in under Xi Jinping over the last two years and again in the last couple of months, uh, which make the compliance obligations now for any uh, data-based firm through its apps or through its platforms much more compliant to the requirements of the Chinese state and the ability of the state to intervene, particularly if that data is being shared with corporations, let alone foreign corporations, let alone foreign corporations based in foreign countries. And the final of my list of five, if you like, in terms of this movement to the left, is what I'd describe as the uh, new Xi Jinping concept of common prosperity. In Chinese for it is gong tong fu yu. What does that mean? You might say, well, China is a socialist country. Of course, they believe in common prosperity. Well, yes and no, because Chinese state or party activism so far has not been um, prominent in any large scale redistribution of wealth away from the Chinese private sector uh, and profits to wages and salaries uh, for their staff. However, that too is changing. And what we see with um, the new promulgations under this concept of common prosperity um, is statements about the importance of improving wage and salary levels, statements about the importance of improving working conditions. Uh, for example, what's often called in the Chinese gig economy, jiu jiu liu, which is um, working from nine till nine, uh, uh, six days a week. Jiu, nine, jiu, nine, liu, six, six meaning Saturday. And therefore, um, the oppressive nature of those working conditions for workers, uh, particularly those who in the past have been accustomed to working in the state sector. And of course, uh, now the requirement for the largest uh, and most successful of the Chinese private sector firms to set up very large philanthropic funds, 
uh, for wider investment back into communities, the society, uh, and into workers. And when I say large funds, I'm talking about $10 billion plus US funds, um, which have been established by a number of these firms literally in the last month or so. So there are four or five barometers of change, which I think is significant. That question I'd like to pose in my remarks today uh, is, well, how big uh, is the change uh, against where we've been in the past? <clears throat> my answer to that is pretty big. <clears throat> If the age of Deng Xiaoping, which in Chinese economic policy terms, went under the rubric of reform and opening, uh, Gai Ge Kaifang ran from the 12th Party Congress back in 1982 to the 19th Party Congress in 2017, uh, it essentially governed um, uh, the overall direction of an incremental move over the years and over the decades of uh, the Chinese economy in a pro-market direction, both at home and China's engagement with markets abroad. I leave to one side all the classical accusations about Chinese state manipulation of markets at home and abroad, but that was the overall policy direction. Uh, within Chinese ideological terms, we often talk about it as being the band of meaning. And under the rubric of Deng Xiaoping and Gai Ge Kaifang, which means reform and opening, uh, it was moving in that overall direction. The big set of changes, however, um, have occurred at the 19th Party Congress um, in 2017 under Xi Jinping. And if you like, that brought to a close the formal era of reform and opening. The Chinese authorities would dispute that. But we now have a new period under Xi Jinping starting in 2017, which we now have a new term for. It's called the new development concept, Xin Fajan Li Nian. And this new development concept becomes the umbrella term under which a whole series of other new, shall we say, economic policy directions are now being set, but whose organizing principle is a greater role for the party and the state over the independent powers of the market and private firms within that market. And what are those other terms? You'll start to hear uh, the um, uh, terms such as the real economy. You'll start to hear terms such as the dual circulation economy. You'll start to hear terms such as national self-reliance, so the function. Um, I've already spoken about the role of state and enterprise reform being redefined, but also you'll start to hear more of terms like common prosperity. The best way I can describe all these terms, which each mean something slightly different, is that it's like a series of Venn diagrams. And some of them are intersecting sets, some of them are overlapping sets, and some of them actually sit next to each other as non-intersecting sets, but still within an overall framework. And the framework is we, the party, are now intervening more uh, in the market in the name of uh, the overall well-being of the state and the overall well-being of individual workers and employees within the state. Next question I wanted to address uh, is as follows. Why have these changes occurred? And how, do we, uh, um, how can we understand why the shift has been brought into being? And here I'd like to identify two or three major sources for these change, changes. Of course, you're not going to have the Chinese political system come out and saying, we're doing all this for X, because it's more complex than that. We have to dig beneath the surface. But as we dig beneath the surface, I think we find three sets of drivers for why this shift to the left is occurring in the policy instruments that I referred to before. And these three sets of motivating forces uh, ideology, demography, and China's interpretation of decoupling, decoupling from the United States. And each of those three has its own impact on Chinese policy decision making. Each of those uh, also overlaps with the other. Let me talk briefly about ideology first. Ideology, as I said before, is often best defined as a band of meaning uh, within China's highest level policy 
and political discourse. I said before, the band of meaning around Deng Xiaoping's term of reform and opening, basically underneath it, then was able to unleash a whole series of individual reformist initiatives across the entire economy, from which grew out the entire explosion of the Chinese private sector, frankly, over time. Um, at a higher ideological level, again, how did Deng Xiaoping do that? Well, it's complex. But in the history of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping describes it now as belonging to three eras, the Mao era, the Deng era, and now the Xi Jinping era. Now, in the Mao era, they described the central mission of uh, the party, really, uh, uh, through until about 1956, and then really through until about 1976, as class struggle. And that's why, frankly, there wasn't much economic growth in that period. It was primarily a political agenda. The second period that Deng brought in in 1978 was called an era which pushed class struggle to one side and where the central mission of the party was ideologically defined as economic development, further defined as unleashing the productive forces in the economy in order to lift people out of poverty and pushing to one side any class consequences or of unequal relations which might have arisen from that period. Marxists describe this as unleashing the forces of production, but relegating the relations of production. That's code language for class. And that essentially is what Deng did ideologically back in 1982 in the resolution of the 12th Party Congress way back then. But guess what? That formal re resolution, which he undertook at that Congress, remained in force until 2017. It was only at the 19th Party Congress in 2017 that Xi Jinping formally changed that central definition of the party's mission in the economy, or to use Marxist terms, the principal contradiction which China was seeking to address. The Chinese is And what did that mean, this new formulation of the party's mission? And I've written on this in the past over the last two or three years. It, it was expressed in these terms. We are now identifying the party's principal mission as rectifying the imbalances and the inadequacies of the previous development model, that is the previous 35 years. And if you like, dealing with, though they don't use this term, the capitalist excesses of that period. Um, we see this, of course, in the statements which are coming out now about common prosperity and income redistribution. We've seen it for some time in terms of a heightened environmental policy intervention by the Chinese government, the party and state, which we all welcome. But we also see it in terms of the party and the state resuming some of the traditional commanding heights functions in the Chinese economy, which Deng Xiaoping had let go during that previous 35 year period. So when I say that ideology matters, what happened in 2017 at the 19th Party Congress really did matter, just like it really did matter what Deng did back in 1982. Because what flows from, as it were, the ideological headwaters of those decisions is creating the political space then for those within the system to innovate around a more interventionist, pro-party, pro-state, more sceptical of the market series of policy interventions of the type that we've seen now with growing intensity in the last 12 months. A second cause of these changes is what I described as uh, China's date of demographic destiny. Now, this is not much in the public debate, but frankly, China's political leaders, I think, have become quite stunned by the recent demographic data. Now, if you look at the um, birth rate in the year 2020, the number of new births in China was down 18% in 2020 compared with 2019. Now, there are COVID factors at work in that, but it doesn't explain such a big adjustment. And in fact, it follows uh, a trend line, which now has the Chinese fertility rate standing at 1.3, very low for a developing country. When in Japan, a fully developed economy, it's at 1.4. The United States, a fully developed economy, it's at 1.7. And so therefore, 
This has caused a degree of concern on the part of top Chinese policymakers. Why? Because part of Xi Jinping's dream for China um, is for China to become not just a fully advanced economy, but on top of that, uh, to become a global great power. And the deep fear of Chinese political and policy leaders is that China becomes old before it becomes rich and powerful. And therefore, why is that relevant to our discussion about moving economic policy towards the left? It's because Xi Jinping has concluded that in order to make it more possible for young Chinese families to have more kids, given that they've formally abolished the one-child policy now, and there is virtually an unlimited opportunity to have kids now, uh, is because it's impossible economically for families to do that, given the huge costs which are now associated with raising a kid. Raising a kid from P to 12 in China for a working class family and lower middle class family is estimated over that period of time as costing something like $115,000 US. That's a lot of money if the income you're on is still relatively low. Um, therefore, what Xi Jinping is doing across a range of policy instruments is to try and increase uh, individual disposable incomes. So if you ask yourself why has he intervened so brutally with the private tutorial sector in China, part of the reason there, part of it, not all of it, um, is because families were spending sometimes 10 to 20% of their income on paying for private tutors. And as a consequence, the ability for families to, as it were, uh, consider the possibility of having additional kids uh, was being completely undermined. Third factor and the final one is this, economic decoupling with the... I've talked about ideology. I've talked about demography. The third driving force is the Chinese leadership's conclusion about which way Joe Biden's America is going to go in terms of the continuation of decoupling trends between the two economies, on trade, on foreign direct investment, on technology, uh, also in terms of new restrictions in capital markets, uh, and also, of course, uh, on uh, other uh, aspects, including uh, the competition between the two countries' currencies as well. Xi Jinping's conclusion is that the United States is likely to continue in this path because of the bipartisan consensus in the Congress about China strategy. And because of that, Xi Jinping does not want to face a series of vulnerabilities like he did over the last several years on the question of semiconductors, Huawei, 5G, and China's vulnerability to US-dominated or controlled global supply chains. Hence the, res the resuscitation of industrial policy, hence the resuscitation of SOE policy, hence the new priority attached to data security policy and the rest. In other words, he's sending a message to his own people and to the United States that decoupling will not be just a discretionary American decision, that China may seek to preempt and get there on its own steam. Um, I've got um, about um, 45 seconds left in my allocated time of 20 minutes. So I'm going to go to the very last point I wanted to touch on, which is what will all this mean in terms of the impact of the real Chinese economy? Well, these are the biggest set of measures impacting the Chinese private sector uh, in a constraining way that we have really seen over the last 35 to 40 years. So therefore, the critical question here is, does Xi Jinping run the risk of killing the goose that laid the golden egg, given the central role of the Chinese private sector in generating growth, employment, productivity, uh, as well as the vast bulk of Chinese innovation as well, and a very large slice of Chinese overall taxation revenues? These are big questions. Um, and we don't have a huge amount of qualitative data yet about the impact on private sector business sentiment, but you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to deduce that there is a high level of anxiety across the Chinese private sector, particularly on the part of large established entrepreneurial firms, uh, which have been successful over the last 20 to 30 years. Not just the Alibabas, not just the Tencents, not just the JDs, not just the DDs not just the Meituans, but others as well. The key barometer here will be what happens, of course, with um, private fixed capital investment numbers. And what we are seeking to analyze is 
how that data will unfold over the next 12 months when all these measures begin to bite. But I know amongst Chinese policymakers, there is a high level of concern about the impact of this. And when you see statements most recently, for example, by Vice Premier Liu He, um, uh, seeking to reassure the Chinese private sector that they still have a cherished place in the economy, it indicates that the Chinese system at its center is concerned about the real impact on growth numbers. The core to China's ability to move out of the middle income trap to become a fully developed economy and to grow over time depends on population, workforce participation, and productivity, or as my American friends say, productivity. Um, but when it comes to productivity, um, having an economy where the state-owned enterprise sector is coming back and the private sector is under pressure is a step in the wrong direction. Total factor productivity growth in China has only stood at about 1.1% annually uh, for the last five to 10 years. That's not sufficient to break through the middle income trap. China needs to lift that, but by providing greater market share for public firms, a more constrained operating environment for private firms, it's difficult for me to see how robust productivity growth is returned to and resumed in the future. So there are my comments, there are my remarks. Over to you, Wendy, and then let's open up the discussion. Well, thanks, Kevin. You sure put a lot on the table. So let me start with a few questions. First, um, I guess my basic question would be, why now? I mean, you've pointed already to five years ago or four years ago, 2017, the 19th Party Congress, and in your in your written remarks, you um, reveal a lot of signals that were there that things were changing, that there was a pivot in place. But why have we seen such a flurry of activity um, over the past two months? Do you expect this kind of robust pace to keep up? particularly to the 20th Party Congress. And do you think it's the 20th Party Congress where Xi Jinping is seeking his third term as kind of the driving force here? Or is it something more complicated than that? I think, uh, Wendy, I mean, it's a critical question because it goes to whether these driving factors will continue to operate uh, beyond the 20th Party Congress as well in pushing Chinese economic policy further to the left again. Why now? I think Xi Jinping has always been a left-leaning ideologist. You see that in what he's done with the party in pure politics, uh, moving, as it were, uh, again, the centre of gravity to the left there. If the barometer is um, the power of local parliaments, the power of the National People's Congress, the power independently of the Chinese legal system as opposed to the power of the party and his power within it, he's engineered in his first term in office a significant shift of politics to the left. Before we go to the economic policy domains we've just been discussing, his second term, I think, has been uh, the gradual unfolding of a parallel, though I thought originally not as intense agenda in pushing the economy to the left, but it has gained pace. Why do I think it's gained pace? I think his preferred approach would have been much more gradual, but what's caused him to gain pace are a series of external events. The US-China trade war of 1819, which came in hard on the heels of the 2017 Party Congress. Then you had the coronavirus crisis of 2020 and into 2021 in part, which again caused him to conclude we need a strong party and a strong state to navigate our way through this. And then his final piece of evidence, if you like, was all the signals and indications out of the White House that uh, whereas Trump had gone, China's strategy had basically remained and was being sustained and in some cases doubled down on in a more systematic way by the Biden administration. I think if you pull all those things together, they've kind of turbocharged a pre-existing ideological predilection to move partially to the left of these uh, economic on these economic policy instruments for reasons of underlying socialism uh, that I referred to before, but turbocharged by these other, as it were, statist factors. 
Will it continue beyond the 20th Party Congress? I think, Wendy, you're right to actually raise the point that I think part of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, campaign effort for November 2022 is to say to the Chinese country and people at large, I'm on your side. I want some of their obscene levels of wealth, this is his campaign pitch, if you like, uh, to be redistributed to you. I want to have more socialism back into Deng Xiaoping's notion of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, and as a consequence, what he's doing is building a plank for his reappointment, and I believe his aspiration is to become leader for life. And on, on top of his, as it were, existing control and leverage, within the internal machinery of the Communist Party itself. So I suspect that once his re-elect is under his belt at the end of next year, there'll be some reappraisal, particularly by his ex senior economic advisers, whether this has gone too far. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a re-evaluation to try and find a better golden mean after the event. But that's a speculation on my part. Between now and the... Um, end of next year, I think we need to fasten our seatbelts for more of the same. So following up on that, Kevin, and you did mention recent comments by Xi's senior political advisor, Li He, this week, where he's almost reassuring, not in my view, not only um, Chinese, the Chinese private sector, but also global investors, um, that um, China continues to support the private sector and that a support for the private sector, he said, won't change. Um, how do you interpret those comments? Is this an indication that there may be kind of internal debate within China, or maybe China's just gone too far um, in its pronouncements over the past couple of months? Or are these just kind of words that are spoken by a, a kind of an overconfident regime, feeling that it's headed in the right policy um, direction? Uh, Liu Ho, the Vice Premier, who um, I know well and um, <clears throat> many Americans know well, uh, he's uh, American trained, but he's um, an economist, and he's the um, Xi Jinping's right-hand man on the economy. So we should well ask ourselves this question, how could this come about uh, in terms of the, my description of the overall shift in the centre of economic policy gravity to the left over the last several years, but the last 12 months in particular. I think there's a reason for that. And that is uh, in the realm of the, of the central leadership, you've got uh, those who are responsible for China's macroeconomic management made up of Liu He, and frankly, the People's Bank of China, uh, run by Yi Gang and before him, Zhou Xiaochuan. Um, and between them, they understand, frankly, as well as any other central bank or any other finance minister in the world, uh, and like the US Secretary of the Treasury, how the global economy really works and what you need to do in order to generate sustained high levels of growth within the Chinese economy as well. And that's the centrality of markets. But there's another group in the Xi Jinping leadership um, team who are from, let's call it the politics, ideology and security and intelligence team. And, um, and that team, frankly, don't know the first thing about how an economy ticks. They don't understand how markets work. They are very much driven by an organising principle called security. Um, and when the security team uh, come up against, shall we say, the economic team, in a normal environment where there is no big perceived internal or external threat, then, frankly, the economic team will normally do OK. But when there is a perceived external threat, as there is at the moment in terms of uh, US-China decoupling um, and um, a range of other challenges uh, to China around the world, and a fear about domestic political security and lead up to the 20th Party Congress, frankly, that team start to win all the debates. And I believe that's what's been occurring. Then what happens, a bit like diplomats, they get sent out to clean up the wreckage afterwards. Um, and I'm sure as a former American trade diplomat, you've had to do a bit of that in the past, Wendy, as well. Not that the United States government would ever make a mistake that needed to be cleaned up afterwards. As an Australian Shut and as a right? Shut <laughs> away. As, an, as an Australian foreign as Australian foreign minister and prime minister, let me tell you, uh, we'd regularly have officials up there cleaning up after various, shall we say, policy miscues. 
So I think this is not um, Liu He and, and his team uh, with a different, as it were, substantive policy message. They are trying to massage markets, fully aware of the fact that these deep policy shifts have occurred. And I believe further doing this, Wendy, in their using their engagements with foreigners to then feed back into the Chinese system and the political and security apparatus that they may well have overreached and to use, as it were, their basis for information, what foreigners are saying and doing, as opposed to what individual policy advisors may be independently recommending within the Chinese system. Okay, I'm going to ask my final question, and then I will we'll turn it over to the audience. So can I um, urge our folks that want to ask questions to um, use the raise hand function or just send me a note in the chat? And that is, Kevin, what does all this mean for U.S.-China relations going forward? I mean, it's hard to be encouraged by your comments when you talk about not only decoupling, but now decoupling that's become a policy direction for China as well. I mean, we used to think of trade or the economy as being the balance, the good part of the relationship. And if this part is really gonna be increasingly strained, how do you see US-China relations going forward? Well, um, I think it's going to be really rough through until the uh, 20th Party Congress. And then I think we reappraise uh, once he's got his re-elect or reappointment under his belt. Secondly, you're absolutely right, Wendy. The economic relationship for 35 years, um, certainly through until the beginning of the trade war, was the central piece of ballast in the US-China relationship. So whatever happened, whether it was Tiananmen, whether it was um, spy plane uh, incidents, uh, whether it was uh, Taiwan policy, uh, whether it was uh, human rights controversies, um, the central ballast which would ultimately stabilise the relationship was this vast network of people engaged in the economy through trade, foreign direct investment, increasingly capital markets, and across the whole spectrum and migration flows as well, people to people. The problem is uh, if it starts to unravel, then the ballast um, becomes much thinner and becomes much uh, uh, lighter and ceases to actually hold the ship steady. And that's where I fear we're headed right now. Um, and of course, when we think about the Cold War between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, one of the reasons why it was so easy to slide into a Cold War with the Soviets was there was no economic engagement. Uh, between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States after the end of the Second World War. A little bit of reconstruction aid, but that was about it. Um, whereas with China, this vast enmeshment um, across all those domains of economic policy I just referred to have hold, held the show together. But they're now cracking. And the big news is that, it is, and I think American policymakers need to be deeply aware of this, it's not just a discretionary decision by the United States now as to whether they decouple and if so, when and how and under what terms. The Chinese are now signaling themselves, signaling themselves, we know that's the direction you're heading in and we intend to get ahead of the curve. My concern is if you then pull the economic ballast out of this, then are you left with something as uh, brittle as what the Soviet Union relationship looked like in the past? that does begin to look like a cold war. Not there yet, but the trend line is bad. <clears throat> okay, I see a number of hands up so that I can talk 